Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started, and we can broaden this conversation. But we're very pleased this evening to have Chaplain um, Rabbi yes. Ruth Belonsky joining us again. Yes. And Rabbi Belonsky is the chaplain in Los Angeles. She's the chair of the Faith-Based Advocacy Council and with the Los Angeles County Department of Mental Health. So these topics we're talking about, coping mechanisms and psychiatric trauma and all of these are exactly what she does, and she's a member of the executive board. So last week we were having such a vibrant conversation. Reverend Bowie invited uh, Rabbi Ruth to return, and, and fortunately she was able to do so. So with that brief introduction, um, Chaplain Ruth, if you would be so kind as to just kind of open up with a few remarks. Now, did everyone receive the questions that we sent around? Yes. Okay, because we sent around questions. Yes that Rabbi Ruth offered as topics to get things started. So perhaps, Rabbi, if you open the discussion, and then if you in the audience have any question that you want to raise or an answer to one of the questions that she raised, then we can kind of lead the discussion that way. And that should be uh, very interesting. So, Chaplain Rabbi Ruth Belonsky, please take it away. <laughs> Thank you. So are we going on last, on last week's questions? I also sent you a whole bunch of new questions but that may be for you know just for people to think about some well, other we time. sent out we sent out the six new questions that you sent they okay. were sent out to the group and uh, you should have received a copy I'm sorry if you didn't but yes all of those questions and then uh, Doris Lee had suggested two questions as well I believe they went out mm -hmm. and before we start I'm wondering if anybody would like to offer us a, a prayer for healing for healing of Reverend the soul. That we've lost. Reverend okay. Bowie. Okay. okay, Reverend Bowie's on. Just, just joined time. us. Just in time. That's just right, in Pastor time. Bowie. <laughs> We're just getting started, and Chaplain Ruth has just asked for a prayer of healing. And so, Reverend Bowie, would you please provide us with an opening prayer to talk about how to heal the pain, how to heal the agony, how to heal the grief? Please pray for us. I don't know. Reverend Bowie? Okay, I don't know if we lost this call. Okay, do we have another pastor who would offer to um, pray, Reverend Grady? Uh, I, I will. That's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, let, let's pray. Let us bow our heads. So. Reverend Bowie. Yes, father. <laughs> oh, go ahead. Reverend Bowie, would you pray for us, please? <laughs> No problem. All right. Uh, prayer prayer uh, of most, peace. For peace. Amen. <laughs> All right. Uh, most gracious God, as we come to you, in the name of Jesus, we simply say thank you, Lord, for you are the Prince of Peace. So we know, Lord, that where you are, and if we are there, that peace is present. We thank you, Lord, for our rabbi, Ruth, um, who has come out, Lord, to share with us this evening. We ask, Lord, that as she shares her life, experience, her knowledge, and uh, her wisdom, that we will not only listen with our ears and minds, but most of all with our heart. May you bless this time that we share together. And, Lord, as we continue to move forward, watch over us, protect us, guide us, and direct us. And, Lord, increase our faith that we may trust you with all our hearts. And lean not to our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledge you as you continue to direct our path. Amen. Amen. Came up with the right words. Thank Amen. you. Amen. <laughs> so um, I, I don't have the new uh, questions that I posed, so if anyone is at their computer and can send it, um, I'm, I have my iPad with me, but I can't find them, so I'd be most appreciative. But what I'd like is, Dor is, Dor is Doris with us today? Yes, ma'am. So uh, may I call you Doris? Oh, of course, yes. <laughs> Thank you. So you, you sent these two questions of how can unresolved sadness due to family tragic tragedy manifest itself in immediate family and extended family members. And I'm wondering why, what prompted you to send that question? Well, I sent the question because 
um, I started observing, or, or, well, mostly via social media because I don't live in Colorado anymore. I started observing um, what I perceived to be anger among Eliza's sisters that I had never seen before. Um, in in responses on social media, as well as as well as for some reason, all of a sudden, I'm, I'm I've got something in my throat, but I just I just observed um, a uh, um, not necessarily anxiety, but I observed um, a level of anger, if you will, or just um, mean spiritedness that um, I had never I had never experienced or observed before, and I and I'm wondering if if you know a result of this of what happened to their brother. Well, it's, it sounds to me as though it would be a very natural response. Um, I don't know about the mean spiritedness, but uh, you know what, uh, how that manifested. But certainly, um, anger. I mean, when I I reread what had happened to Elijah, I felt extreme anger. When I when I've seen what has happened to so many so many people who have been killed and murdered and Whose, whose words haven't been heard and whose affect haven't been taken into consideration, I felt anger. So I, I can't even imagine the extreme anger that somebody else must have felt with a family member that had been treated in this way. So I think that that's a natural reaction. And there are, there are other reactions that we might um, have expected, which is um, sometimes maybe even feeling it's unfair to be living when the other person has died or very bitter about the death, or extremely lonely, or difficulty to trust others, and um, avoiding maybe reminders of the person who died, and um, disbelief, feeling stunned or or dazed, Um, you know, all these things, everybody experiences death of a loved one in different ways, but... I think only the people who have experienced death, the death of a loved one in this kind of a trauma, know what it feels like because nobody else can experience that and can know what that feels like. Does that give you any answer? Yes, actually it does. And it it, um, it, it, it helps me understand that the way I'm processing it has nothing to do with the way they are. Hmm. And so... You know, um, what I what I really am going to focus on is, is finding ways to find support for them, even though it's uh, you know we are at a distance because I, um, their grandmother, my sister, is actually a uh, minister, and so what I would what I'm going to try to do is organize a prayer hour or something like that. We could all call in and and let her lead. Um, with the ex- with the expectation that you know we all try to use it to um, to heal um, in some way or or to at least process it in some way. So um, that's what this organization has helped me work through is how can I uh, and that that goes to my second question is you know um, is pre- can I use that and I'm I I kind of it was kind of a rhetorical question but I I know that prayer helps. And so using her as a conduit to, to bring the family together, since we're spread out, I think will be hopefully a way to help us heal. Well, that sounds wonderful. I also think what's really important is, um, is if uh, you maybe um, traditional prayer helps you, but also prayer from the heart, crying out to God. You know, um, there's there was a rabbi in the, um, late 1700s, early 1800s, who died very young, um, and he lived with very deep depression. But he used to say, go out into the fields and cry out to God, call out to God of your pain, of whatever it is that troubles you, asking for help. So in whatever way you can find with the family, with your family, uh, you know, you have to find a way in each person each person mourns differently. You and your sister may be mourning differently because your sister is the grandmother of this wonderful young man who was lost to her. And the 
his sisters are mourning differently. Everybody, generationally, if you think about it, you and your sister are generationally very different to the other family members. So you've also had very different life experiences, and your life experiences really are what bring you to the place that you find your own way to grieve as the following generations need to find their own way to grieve. So if anger is a way to, to, to um, release some of that pain, then that's what they need to do. And so I think your, your position and, and your sisters maybe as leading something together is asking for personal prayer as much as traditional prayer. Because out right, of that right. may come some solace and out of that may come some light, which is to understand, try and understand what happened. It's beyond my understanding. And I don't know how one gets over this. I don't know if one ever gets over this somehow. You know, um, if I may, I'd, I'd like to just offer something personal again. And, and that is about this dear friend of mine, um, um, Donald Woods and, and Nobande Le Biko, um, Steve Biko's sister. Um, at the time when Donald was banned because he was the editor of the newspaper, and um, he wrote about the death of Stephen Biko and how he was killed and died. And because of that, he became a danger to the government because it went out all over the world. And so the government banned him, which meant that he wasn't allowed to write anything. And he wasn't allowed to see any more than two people at a time. He wasn't allowed to um, go out of the area, f five miles out of the city um, district. And... Um, and outside their house, across the road, there, was a, there were two security police, which would be the equivalent of the FBI here, I think, um, uh, sitting outside watching to see who entered his house. And I'm sure that their house was bugged, our house was, our, our phone was bugged, but we weren't sure that our house was bugged. And so um, after he finished writing his book, um, it was five days before Christmas, I think, and my my husband had left the country to go and to come and see whether or not he could find a job um, in an architectural practice. So I was with the children. And one night, I think it was just before Christmas, um, I heard a soft knock on the door, uh, the front door. And um, I was always anxious in case somebody was going to shoot into our home as they had done to others. And I went to the door and I looked through and I saw that, I put the porch light on and I saw that it was Donald. And he beaconed, beckoned me to come out, put his finger to his lips, and he said, you know, come out. I've got something to tell you. So we went outside underneath a pine tree in the stars, and he told me there that he was planning to escape from South Africa and um, asked me if I would help. So I won't go into the details of it, because if any of you have the opportunity or if you've seen it, Cry Freedom is the movie that was made about him and about Biko. Well, when I had to say goodbye to my friend... Wendy, his wife, my closest, dearest friend, I found we, we had no words for one another. We held each other deeply, and I thought I would never see her again or the family with their five children. Now, that's not the same kind of traumatic death and experience as what has happened with Elijah or any of these other men and women who have been killed by the police. But I have to tell you that every now and then something triggers my memory, and I weep. Even now, as I'm talking to you, I weep for the loss. I weep for the grieving, the loss of, the, of, of what we had together. They've died since, and I still survived them. So what I'm trying to say to you is that even if you get through a period of grieving now, in, in intense grieving, you never get over it. And with the kind That's of trauma true. that your family has experienced, they will never get over it. But they will be able to, at some stage, I hope, carry on living and survive. And so if you feel that um, sometimes the pain is too much to bear and will this ever end, some of the worst pain ends, I think. But um, maybe you've all lost a parent uh, or, or some other family member, and you know what that feels like, that that feeling always comes back to you. It can be triggered by a smell, by something that you <laughs> eat, by a song, by anything. And uh, that's what sometimes triggers the memory and brings back that pain, and somehow um, you manage to cope with it. Does that no. give you any sense, an idea of how you may manage your pain with your family? 
Yeah, it, it really does. And, and your point is very well taken in that we lost our mother 36, 34 years, 30, yeah, 34 years ago. And I, and she was my best friend. And I still tear up at times when I think of her or to your point when something, because people tell me I look like her. And when I, even, even when I hear that, I either smile or I cry. One of the two. So I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Oh, Rabbi like, Ruth, Rabbi uh, Ruth, you asked the question about the questions you submitted, and I yeah. have them here, and I can read them to the group so everyone can respond if they wish. Please do. Sorry, just before we do that, Doris, is that insufficient for you for tonight? Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. Go okay, ahead. Okay, Doris, I don't mean to rush you, Doris, if there's something else oh, no, that you want to no, express. This was, this was perfect. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. Um, Rabbi Ruth sent us some questions, so I'll just read them, and then people can react as they wish. The first one was, in what ways has spirituality helped you in your understanding of the divine higher power or the God of your understanding? Number two, how has your spirituality helped you to deal with illness, stresses, or crisis situations? Three, how has your spirituality helped you to cope with personal trauma as well as community trauma? Four, have you been able to find new meaning or purpose in life as you deal with personal loss, broken relationships, distance relationships, suffering, or illness? Five, have you experienced spiritual growth or transformation on your journey as you deal with the painful difficulties caused by the pandemic or how to reconnect with community life? And number six, where have you found beauty in your life and how has that influenced your spirituality? What is your most cherished belief? In what ways is this belief spiritual or how does it help your spiritual journey? Those are the questions that she sent out. Mm -hmm. Georgia, just a comment. I wonder how much uh, generation uh, differences uh, impact even how we read these questions. Um, just making a, a comment that the term spirituality was not common in my vernacular, my age growing up. And everything that she's asking and what I thought of was when I was growing up, it could be related to uh, what you believe, what you believe in. Right. Maybe like what, what ways has what you believe in God helped you? Because we didn't really use the term. I wasn't exposed to the term spirituality until my later years. And uh, just to comment. I appreciated the questions, but... Uh, that was the comment. Can, that, mm -hmm. yeah. can I follow you? Um, can I follow up on Dr. Dunstan's comment? Absolutely. Because I, I was sitting here trying to think of how I could say almost the same thing. It is uh, my healing, my growth. I had. I never would use the word uh, spirituality. I never used the word higher power. Those words had no meaning at all to me. When I discovered that Jesus Christ was personal, was my friend, that when I was sick, I prayed and he healed me. When I had tears and was brokenhearted, he sent uh, a, a, a word or a person to 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 heal my brokenheartedness. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was lost, he found me. Mm -hmm. when, when I was confused, uh, I used the, the, the Word of God, which is Jesus is the Word uh, with me. It, it, and it was, and it still is. Uh, when I had, um, I, I had to break free of, of um, all kinds of issues I had. And I caught on, not spirituality, I never caught on higher powers. I don't know anything about that. But a personal walk relationship with Jesus is what brought me 
healing and what heals me even today. Then that is your spirituality. I didn't grow up with that word either. It only came to me much later in Mm -hmm. my life. And in fact, um, um, Dr. Myers, you know, I sent you a second round of questions and at the end there was a story. Do you think you can find that? Okay, Uh, let me me pull that out. I think I... So just while you're doing page, that, we'll while you're doing that, just I think that you know this word spirituality is kind of a um, more of a new way, new term mm-hmm. for looking for a way of making a um, a connection mm-hmm. to the mm-hmm. divine. Yes. And for you, Jesus Christ became the divine for you and helped you through all these amazing times that you you needed help. Right. And everybody right. finds their own way, right? Mm-hmm. Right. 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 Mm-hmm. Is there any other comment about about this in particular or in general? Well, uh, this is Pastor Grady. Go ahead. I'll, I'll yield. Go ahead. No, no. Go ahead, Pastor Grady. I'm just going to say mindfulness is a is a is a similar term right now, uh, in that it's it's it, it, it's being used. It's very popular now. But I was wondering what were the other terms. That we that some of the older ones of us grew up with that capture this this essence of mindfulness today. I guess. Me- meditation, meditation is is what brought me very close to, to God. They mm-hmm. call it mindfulness today, but of course, mm-hmm. to me, I call it. I guess mm-hmm. those of us of another era, maybe we just know what the new terms are, but mm-hmm. still relate to the old terms. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I think of. Meditation, sure. but mindful is a nice term. Yes. Now, Rabbi Ruth did send some other input, so let me go through it uh, so we'll all be on mm-hmm. the same page here. Some of her other comments. Would spirituality and resiliency be promoted by better understanding of historical and generational trauma? Question two, should we try to memorialize those who have been lost to police violence and community gun violence by prayer and action. Three, what would it take to offer rituals and or national days of mourning? Four, is it possible to support all the families who have lost loved ones experiencing trauma and loss? Should we encourage ways to support families who have lost their sense of culture and where they have come from before expecting them to have a soul or spiritual experience? Is there a missing link? In Judaism, we have four specific days in which we remember and honor our ancestors with Kaddish. This mourner's prayer for the living and is also said every Saturday to remember those who have died in the past week, month, or year. We also have Passover, which is a time to tell the story of Exodus and our own stories every year to focus on the plagues and talk of the plagues of the present time. Six, how can oral tradition be used to bring healing of the soul and safety in the community. Seven, do you think that any of the above thoughts might infuse communities with more spiritual experience, connecting to the safety of the community as well as to offer healing? And then she quotes a story from Anthony DeMello's One Minute Wisdom. We see the dilemma in defining spirituality for ourselves, much less trying to define it for someone else. The disciples were absorbed in a discussion of Lao, Suits his dictum, those who know do not say, those who say do not know. When the master entered, they asked him what the words meant. Said the master, which of you knows the fragrance of a rose? All of them knew. Then he said, put it into words, and all of them were silent. The authors then asked, what is spirituality? This question is followed by, to have the answer is to misunderstood the question. Truth, wisdom, goodness, beauty, fragrance of a rose all resemble spirituality in that they are intangible, ineffable realities. We may know them, but we can never grasp them with our hands or with our words. When people come to us in our churches and congregations, should we be learning how they understand their spirituality at that point in their lives as we explain their religious beliefs? I'm sorry this wasn't sent out, but I will send it out to you. 
So sorry, regret that. But at any rate, if that's what you were referring to, right, uh, Rabbi? Yes. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's it's a lot for you to hold on to. I was <laughs> hoping that you could read it, but you know, if it is sent out by Dr. Myers, mm-hmm. you can take your own time and some other time maybe to discuss it with each other uh, and see if there's anything that resonates in there with you. I wondered what would a national day of healing look like and and who would be invited. I mean, uh, if it's about violence, we certainly have to have um, people who were gunned down by the neighbors. It could not just be, you know, for uh, the police shooting black men. And then we, we don't know. Oh, what other people would like to, to put in here as, as something that their culture needs healing from. So I guess we'd have to find out is where is the universal pain? Where, where does it connect, connect individually? But it's, I remember uh, I was worked with Mrs. King for 30 years, and she always wanted us to have a time of reconciliation as they did in South Africa. So could you speak to that, Rabbi, of how reconciliation in South Africa might relate to how we could have reconciliation and healing here? That's a very big question. Um, You know, again, I'll speak from my own uh, life experience, and that is that the we have a, a, a national day of mourning uh, uh, when we remember the Holocaust. We have one day, remember it frequently, but there's one day that the whole Jewish, all Jewish faith, all the different, um, it, it, um, the different congregational lives of Jews recognize that day as Holocaust Memorial Day. And we all say particular prayers. We say the Kaddish and, and, other, and other memories of the people who have, um, the generations that have come from the people who no longer are alive. And my thought was more along the lines of with African-American communities that, you know, um, I've been reading about people who who have gained um, um, a success, I guess, through submitting through through the, um, uh, I can't even think of words now, through through the computer, through through, uh, uh, chat, chats or tweets or whatever um, platform you can find, and it starts to generate and take on a life of its own to say that there should be a day a year when we remember all the all those people who have been shot within communities and all mm-hmm. those people who were killed by the, by the police. And then it starts to take on a life of its own and starts to mm-hmm. grow. But somebody has to start somewhere. Absolutely. And, it and then it starts year after year to become something mm-hmm. like what I did, and suddenly Juneteenth um, appeared. It did always mm-hmm. be there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that was more along the lines of what I was thinking, was that within the, within the um, African-American communities that you would start that. And then maybe it would take off and go into other communities. We don't know. There may be many other communities who would want to mourn along. Mm-hmm. Just as Black Lives Matter has started off small and has drawn every single uh, uh, community out there. So it's got to start somewhere, though. I guess that's what I was envisaging. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yes, this is uh, uh, Pastor Bowie speaking. Uh, What I would say to each and every one of us is that when it comes to our faith spirituality, we have to be careful if we only come to one answer and only one way how people do things. Now, there are some absolutes. Uh, one of the things that I've learned that, one, one, we must learn to respect other, each other's faith if we're going to come together and work together and, and come together what we can agree upon, opposed to always fighting and disagreeing on what we don't, don't agree upon. And I would say that one of the things very important for us, when especially as Christians, because it's one of the big words that is used by Jesus um, when it comes to how will they know that we are his disciples. 
and it's what? Our love for one another. And God loves what? The entire world. And what's going to make the difference is that love of God that makes the difference. For God is love. And I, I and and let's also understand that our spirituality is never a destination here. It's always a, always a continuous journey. Well, Mrs. King uh, used to talk about the beloved community. This was a, um, a community that would be like a world house where we would all come together. And, you know, I thought that maybe one day it could emerge from the King Center because that, that's what I, I heard John, John Lewis talk about that, that there is a beloved community that recognize that all of us are made in the image of God and needs respect. But maybe we should find something maybe in the black community that is already a tradition. I mean, that's one way of tapping into to that. Um, or, or there's um, the African American Museum, you know, um, that that's an institution that's already there. There are uh, rituals that we that we already have, but it's just something to think about. How, how do you get started? Mm-hmm. You start something new, or do you jump in someplace else? Or maybe you combine the two. Mm-hmm. Nothing is, uh, you know, you don't have to do either or. If you find your own what whatever ritual, um, or or uh, prayer or whatever whatever it is that you feel will bring healing. The people in the community know the best what will work for them, at least in some way. Right. So Rabbi I would Ruth, agree with that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Rabbi Ruth mentioned Juneteenth, and it's very interesting you mentioned that holiday because it is it is a, a, a day that people are mm-hmm. asking to be a national holiday. Yeah. And interestingly, today I was asked to do a public service announcement for a Juneteenth organization in Pennsylvania that I'd never heard of before, but they're working with uh, the Caribbean, Africa, and America to do ancestor recognition and all kinds of positive things about 1619. So maybe that should be the place where the ones we have lost are honored and remembered. That would be very interesting. Well, it's a discussion to be had, isn't it? This is Reverend Bowie. We already have quite a few things that we do celebrate, whether we acknowledge or not. Number one, Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday is a big day in which African Americans celebrate. I think that, Mm -hmm. and I believe that the rabbi has made a great suggestion, not limiting it to just one thing. But there are several um, spaces that we can come together as a people and should come together to be able to celebrate. And um, Juneteenth, thank God, is getting a great deal of traction where even Stevie Wonder now is looking to push, is one of the leaders right now pushing for that to become a national holiday. But I think that there are so many things that we can celebrate. The um, Emancipation Proclamation in which we should look at. So not limiting it to just one day, but limiting to several things that we all, some of us already do celebrate. Mm. Could we take the conversation back to the healing? Because I think that's mm-hmm. so important. Mm-hmm. The question of how can we heal our community? How can we well, move forward, not just in the black community, but the whole country? Right. Right. Uh, Reverend Reynolds was talking earlier today about the need for, um, what was your phrase, Reverend Reynolds? The need for us to, to change America as we go forward and have um, a whole new approach to healing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we need to take advantage and understanding of this moral compass that encircles the whole universe, that we have a sense of, of righteousness. It's something that, that is beyond the right. We could use spirituality. Cause it has to be something beyond politics that gives us a sense of direction of, of, of how we live our lives, how we love one another, how we respect one another. Because if we just, I mean, everything is divided. 
I mean, mm-hmm. even the way we talk about God is, is divided. But we need to have this, this moral arc that Dr. King talked about, the, the moral arc of the universe that can encompass all of us and that always spins back towards justice. So, you know, I just think that we have to see, have a, a moral vision of, mm-hmm. of America that will include all of us, whether we're Democrats or Republicans or whatever these, all these divisions. We've got to find a principle that, that brings us up higher than our divisions. So, I mean, that, you know, that's one way of, of, of thinking and talking about the future. Mm-hmm. Well, this is uh, Pastor okay. J.J. How's everyone doing? Because he's not got a chance to to ch- chime in, I, I, I would just want to touch on something that Pastor Bui uh, was saying. We one thing we we need to do is is uh, we have to survey and 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 find out how how many uh, actually there are so many things. Put it like this: there are so, we there are so many activities that we just don't share enough information about that goes on that throughout our communities, throughout the throughout the land. We do a lot of and, and a lot of it is a good it's so the great activities, but we're just so fragmented. So we don't need to reinvent the wheel. But I think we do uh, do mm. enough research to find out. You know where you know we have mothers that we have annual days for. We talk about healing, but we bring mothers who have lost loved ones, have lost their children to gun violence. You know, and then some have lost it too. Too a law enforcement, and but it's, they do great work, but they but they're separated, and they work. So, right. And that's that. That goes on, and even like again, somebody just brought the point. Unfortunately, even our churches, and our and our synagogues, and our temples, and our faith base, you know, we should be the ones yeah. showing, like Pastor Pastor Bowie said, you know, using our greatest weapon, love, and we, and we should be exemplifying that love, and and we 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 gang banging harder than the bloods and the crips. Yeah. You know. <laughs> can, can I uh, say something? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I and I agree with with everything that's been said, and I think one of the things, the assumption of spirituality or whatever uh, phrase you're going to coin, requires participation in a process that was developed from the foundation of the world. It would be great if if it just it just involved a one sided conversation with deity, and deity would intervene in humanity, and and everything would be well. But it requires a a, a heart that's been changed. It requires a passion that is connected to something outside of itself. It requires a witness that is seen in the streets, in the communities in which we live, and and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and a courage that extends far beyond the law. Uh, we're dealing with an issue here in El Paso about uh, getting rid of the police chief. Uh, and, and so one of the questions, okay, we get rid of the police chief, and who's going to replace him? Well, someone else whom he's already trained so, so, so uh-huh. it would be the same guy with a different name because it's systemic in nature, and and the change that we seek must first begin individually and then become a collective mm-hmm. of people gathering together in our communities, modeling. That's that's a big word for me. Modeling the consistency of what happens when people are connected in 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 the common unity that is positioning others with an opportunity to see that lived out in a way that attracts them into that kind of a community. But it's it's about a partnership, and that's that's really the dilemma. Uh, all of the Zoom calls I've been on this week have, have, have had some great, great ideas, great ideas, but at the end of the day, it requires a partnership. This past the code, and I, I, I know the events and all are great that usually will pull the multitude in but I think it's very important that after that event in that community there's what's called follow up and that they see that you're consistent that that that, that you're coming back that you're really concerned you you're listening to their to their needs and their wants and then being able to um approach it from a realistic um point of view uh, our own personal bias when it comes to dealing with things. Um, you know, when we talk about loss with guns, um, like I do, I have the movement, it's called Put Your Guns Down, but when you get to it, which you understand, we all have a loaded gun. 
mm-hmm. if it's our attitude, uh, if we're dealing with depression, that that's a gun. And then how do we deal with it collectively to help each other through that mm-hmm. process? Communication is so key. Um, and, and, and you'll find out those that beef with each other, because we got a lot of neighborhood issues. You know, you live two blocks down, you shouldn't be up here. Mm-hmm. Being, being able to find out who the head is of that and getting them to, to be able to agree to disagree and, and giving them that platform, that's where we would come in, that platform where they could talk with each other. It would be sort of like a mediation and start building that trust. You know, we can wait on the government and stuff, but we need that 911 right now. So I always ask, if you willing, if you want the community to change, are, are you willing to make that commitment yourself to be there for them? Don't just let them see you once or twice a year. But are you willing to just come in there and start developing that relationship and building realistic programs that will help them? I know right now with this pandemic, there's a lot of abuse and a lot of craziness going home within the home. And I, our children, I was on the Zoom with some kids in Baltimore, and one of their biggest fear is failure. Now that they're not able to go back to school, they're very traumatized how they go to school one day and the next day there's no more. So we got a lot of issues going on. We got a lot of fires, a lot of fires. And the church sometimes is not really ready to deal with the fires if it's outside the building. Um, training needs to start in, in there um, with our leadership to teach them how to deal with that community. And then remember, in the community now in America, you got so many different cultures that build that community. That's another reason why we got a lot of conflict going on. Well, Pastor Grady talked about something called dependency. And I have seen that because of the, the virus, uh, many of us who are not, who don't have churches, are are doing uh, our own counseling. Uh, you know, other other words, I'm busier now as a minister than I will, ever was before, and we uh, are unhinged from the pastors, and we can't call on uh, the pastors to do everything uh, that we want done. So I see more community uh, participation by those without mm-hmm. titles, without rank, and without, um, mm-hmm. you know, all of this, be, because it, it, we see that the, the, the church doors are closed. You can't get to the pastors all the time. So we're mm-hmm. becoming more more independent instead of dependent, as Pastor Gray was saying. Right. Exactly. So it might be that... that uh, little groups, because I learned from a, a great man in my life that people count, but God makes the the people we have. We count people, but God makes the people we have count. And that right. was taught to me by no other no other great man than Reverend Boy. You know, I Louis really taught us that my in my ministry. Uh, we we practice that now. We don't think that we have to have multitudes to get something done. You know, we can try with the with the numbers we do have, and it does grow. Well, you know, there's this philosophy that crisis creates opportunity. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. We are going through this period now. You're saying that the pastors are becoming more independent, the ones who don't head churches. Is there a healing? strategy or a new kind of healing community that is needed um, that that can be created through some of these people where should it be if it's not the church should it be at the schools if it's not the schools should it be in homes where can the center of healing be as we go through this crisis uh, I, I, I think i think it starts in the community again we have the buildings sitting there now the buildings are pretty much empty but there are still pastors and leaders uh, in our community, they're waiting on this season to pass. So we have to get, I, I know we're afraid of the, the COVID-19. Uh, there was a protest here in El Paso and Black Lives Matter, and 
And I went down. I was one of the few pastors who went. And the people who had our signs who were chanting our slogans were not looking like us. Because most of the African American pastors in church was at home watching it on TV, trying to find out who told them to do that. <laughs> they're not, they, you know, they not black. They, why, they, they don't know nothing about George Floyd, but you sitting at home in your comfort zone. So we have to sort of stir up the pot. And, and I meet with pastors, and, and, and I try to confront them with the issue: is you know why have why are we so afraid to? Uh, 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 expose the darkness and offer the alternative as the light of a common unity, even in 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 our in our cities. So it has to go mm-hmm. back. It's still going to be the church, but the church is looking different now because those same people who we met in the pews on Sunday are now at home looking out the window. But we've got to mm-hmm. find a way to get them motivated to go out. And, and I know it's scary. This is a scary time for believers all over, no matter what yeah. your faith is. But we cannot continue to allow the enemy to rule our communities when we have been equipped and protected for such a time as this. Well, I think Zoom is really a helpful organizing tool because I'm on with people now that I've never even met before. Well, I would do something right here in in Prince George County or, or or the district. And now I'm communicating, making friends with people like Reverend Grady that I've never seen before. And, I mean, you know, the reach is is greater. Yes. Yes. It really is. So I I don't, you know, like I said, I do see a a silver lining in it because, you know, I'm on two and three Zoom calls a day and can see the people. Where before you had to get in your car, you had to go to a building, fight traffic, and now we have to do um, is go to the computer or phone and, and push a button, and there we are. So it has made some things more simple. Oh, yeah. I agree. Yeah. But, but, and then the other but, things, but, of course, not so simple when people are dying and alone in hospitals and we can't get there, then the yeah. people who have to be consoled. Lord so it's it's simple in one way and not another. Yeah. Rabbi yeah. Ruth, um, I'm here. Oh, uh-huh. Uh huh. How do you respond to what you're hearing from from our other? Well, pastors? I've just been taking down words about healing centers and finding out and giving tools, trust, failure, and I'm and I'm thinking of language and conflict and. I don't think that we can have a, the same kind of reconciliation. I was asked a question about a reconcil- reconciliation commission. South Africa is um, a small country, and um, so it was. I think it's easier to have a reconciliation commission in a country um, of that size. There has to be a different way of managing that. And I, I go back again to the healing, and I think healing. Healing someone is listening to someone, you know, and mm-hmm. if you start with one person, it's really one person who you heal or you help to understand their pain, then reaches out to another person because they know that they can help somebody else. And so the ripples go, and uh, we will never know what kind of um, impression we have made on somebody who we sit and listen to and that maybe allows their pain to emerge, and through that is maybe a possibility of reaching out to the people who are shooting each other. It's not easy, and we have these wonderful large ideas which we would really like to to heal the whole world, but really it starts with one, and as um, Pastor Bowie was saying, it's love, and it's looking at each one in in my estimation is starting with one person and moving to the next and moving to the next and seeing if they will become the disciples. That's the best that I can offer right now. I also think when I was growing up, I had no tools of language about how I was feeling. I came from a German background. And nobody in German, in my German family talked about how they were feeling, let alone spirituality. You know, we went to, <laughs> we went to, we went to temple every Friday night and Saturday and kept as many of the laws as we could, but we didn't talk to each other about our feelings. And only when I came here and after my own post-traumatic PTSD experience of of some of the things that happened to us in South Africa, took me about 15 years to acknowledge that I really needed to talk to somebody. 
I had to pay somebody <laughs> to, to listen to me and to sort out and give me words, language to express I'm, I'm, I'm feeling such deep pain. I'm feeling anger. I feel nothing. I, I, I feel blank. I don't know how to express what's going on inside me. I'm, I'm traumatized. I, I, I'm mourning. I'm grieving. I didn't know those words. And I think that that's what we have to give the youth today. I really don't think that they have the language to express themselves. Mm. So they express themselves in different ways. And usually it's with anger because they don't know how to talk to one another. So I don't have the answers for that. I just, I'm, I'm just stoking the fires here, you know? <laughs> Something to think about for communities, and then maybe it will spread, and maybe you'll, somebody within your group will be um, tech savvy and be able to put something out and maybe other people will start to read it and will start to grab onto it when you have these successes of one at a time. Uh, it's the same as I think, um, am, I, am I my brother's keeper? Am I my sister's keeper? You know, yes, love the stranger. So <laughs> however you go about it within your communities, I think that that, to me, is the answer, is the one by one by one. Uh, yes, um, this is uh, Reverend Bowie once again. Also, I think too often we minimize the great changes that have already taken place. Because we, w one of the things that six months ago, we would have not seen those police officers who killed George Floyd arrested and in prison. And we, we tend to just run past that. And I think we've got to sometimes slow down to begin to celebrate many of the victories that we have. Even right now, as people are protesting right now, there has been great change. Also, as we talk about, it isn't just simply Black Lives Matter. We have other people that Pastor Grady has mentioned that don't look like us has now got they, they're, they're seeing, they're understanding and responding to what we've been crying out for years. And are we celebrating that? You, you understand what I'm saying? And mm -hmm. this, is, this is very important for us to understand. Equality, equity, uh, um, justice is not a destination. It is a continuous journey that we're on. But let's take time to celebrate and appreciate some of the victories. Even today, as we are gathered together, what we're doing today is part of that change that has already taken place. One, who would have thought six months ago we would have had um, Rabbi Ruth here? And we're able to dialogue and share and build community together and build the community, true community, extends outside of your community as well. Right. And this is taking mm -hmm. place right now. And one of the reasons why we have not built community is because the dominant culture has basically divided and conquer, conquered us instead of what we are doing tonight. And thank you so much, uh, Rabbi Ruth, because right now, even as we're having this conversation, we are building the beloved community right now. And we've got to recognize yeah. and acknowledge that. Yeah. I wish you could be hiding. <laughs> Reverend Bowie, this is Renata, and I, I, I just want to echo what you said. That's something I've been teaching all day. I've been working in Indiana, but we have got to learn to celebrate those small victories. Mm -hmm. Because you're going to have many more small victories before you have that larger one. So we've got to embrace every positive action, every positive reaction, all the good that comes out, on, however small it is, because it's a piece of a puzzle that continues to expand. So, Reverend Bowie, this, you know, this is Doris, and I just want to echo that also, because a year ago when this happened to Elijah, um, I prayed to have the, um, the the awareness that we have about him now. Not only did I pray, but I wrote, I think I told uh, you guys this, I wrote an impassion letter, and I sent it out to every major network, and I sent it out to every radio station, and I, I received not one response. But to see that oh it's happening, it, 
to see that it's happening in a way that I never imagined, I I do celebrate that every day. So you're absolutely right. We we have to accept yeah. those, you know, those the, the positive parts of it too. That's interesting. That that's very. I think yeah. it was Reverend Grady who earlier was saying that the young people we have to find a new language, or it might have been Reverend JJ, but. One year, a few years ago, a young man said to our group, Black Women for Positive Change, he said, look, we want to be great. He was about 18 years old. He said, we want to be great. And the adults in our lives are not giving us dreams. You aren't teaching us anything. We don't just want to be average, walk-along people. We want to change the world. And you're not helping us to dream. You're not helping us to do anything. And he said, that's why we're angry. And that's why we're mm. fighting. And that's why we join gangs. Because you have failed to give us dreams yeah, and showing us how to become great. Mm. Wow. Mm. That's very that's powerful. powerful. Yeah, Real powerful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is there anything anybody would like to ask me still today before we, if I have an answer, maybe I don't, maybe I haven't given any good answers today. Um, but oh, yeah. Any, mm-hmm. Is there anything that one, anyone would like to raise? Uh, well, like to the, there was a question raised last time that had me up. I think uh, Georgia Dunstan raised it. Is Is what was God saying to us through the Holocaust mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and what was God saying through us through slavery? I mean, it yeah. was raised. I wrestled with it. I woke up the next morning trying to, and I still can't seem to figure it out or to understand. Mm-hmm. Anybody else, remember, do you or anyone have any understanding of why would God let that happen and what what was God saying through that? I have no answers. I'm sorry. Maybe somebody else does. <laughs> <laughs> <I don't. laughs> well, Dr. Dunstan shouldn't erase it. <laughs> People right. are awake Dr. trying Dunstan, to figure it out. Answer? Yeah. You Dunstan, answer it, Georgia. Answer? Yeah. <laughs> don't think that there yeah. haven't been thousands of rabbinic rabbis who haven't tried to make to find a way to answer it, and there is... There is no easy answer, I don't think. I think that all, all we can do is be the best people that we are with whatever genealogy we've been given, with whatever historical trauma we've been given, uh, and do the best we can. And I, I'm, I'm still struck by what Reverend Bowie said about how he is proud to be who he is, even though he doesn't really know his, his, uh, his ancestors, and that He's living, he's living a life because of them, and he's uh, a, a very um, uh, charismatic speaker because I can hear yeah. myself saying, sitting in his community and saying, Amen, with my hands raised. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. so, so, yes, we're all, uh, all, all I think we can ask of ourselves in, in, in a, an indirect sideways answer is to the, do the best with our lives that we can and to use the gifts that we've been given, whatever they are, to the best of and, our ability in God's And there's the same thing with slavery, because the other day I was sitting here, and I was thinking, wow, you know, I can go back to great-great-grandmother, and maybe that could have been me there in slavery, getting chained to a tree and made to work in the hot Mississippi sun, from sun up to sun down, and I was just figuring out um, what do you make of that? What 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 do you make of that? What did God say through that? And I guess the answer is maybe the same that you just said. Um, there are no easy answers, and to make the best of this life, knowing that somebody prayed for you, and somebody sacrificed for you, and somebody mm. took the whip for you. Mm-hmm. and to try to make the best life out of that and leave a better legacy for those to come. You mm-hmm. be said. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Very good. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that this is a good <laughs> session. I think that, you know, the, yeah. there are no easy answers and how to create a healing environment in our communities mm. to create safety 
is a tough is a question, but we have to keep dealing with it. How and where yeah. can we change the culture of violence in America? Mm-hmm. That's the challenge. And uh, the, we'll be, you know, continuing to discuss this issue. What are We're sending out letters to governors, uh, Black Women mm-hmm. for Positive Change, next week, asking them to think about establishing de-escalation academies in their yeah. state. Amen. And you know maybe we can 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 get a state to become a um, a, a role model. Um, Reverend Grady, maybe we can get Texas yeah. to set up some de-escalation centers. Or mm-hmm. we've approached yes. the Speaker of the House in Maryland to see if she'll perhaps reach out to the Governor of Maryland. But someone's got to take the beginning to create healing centers. So I tell yeah. Renata De Valerie that uh, maybe she'll be the first director of a de-escalation center. Um, she's a conflict resolution expert. She knows how to do all this stuff. And DG Mon yeah. and the mediation organization. So we have to pull on the yeah. resources. We have some fabulous, brilliant resources, and, and all of you are incredibly uh, talented and skilled. So we just have to figure out a way to mobilize and organize. Or well, coordinate, like uh, whatever you say, because that, I think about it. We have. Uh, 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 replicas of, of things that are healing the culture of violence right right in front of us. You know, we can think of Colton Kaepernick. You know, we can think of uh, the, the King Center. We can think, you know, if we think about it, we, we will see them right before our eyes of, sure. of institutions, peoples, churches that are uh Change, trying to change the culture of violence. They're just all over the place. The the guy who yeah. built the, the the monument, I think, in Memphis to lynching. I mean, that that's that's a a way to think. You know, they're they're there, maybe in plain sight. We just have to to step back and reflect on what we're looking at. All right. And at the same time, you have some senator who wants to take the money from any school district that teaches black history about 1619. Senator God. Cotton, he wants to pass yeah. a law that any district that does, as you're saying, Reverend Reynolds, uh, talks about the people who are the heroes, the people who are mm-hmm. doing things to change the culture. He wants to take the money away from the schools if they should dare to teach that yeah. kind of information. Yeah. So what do we yeah. do about that? We act, I suppose. <laughs> we got to go back to the community, back to the back to those people who claim to be connected to the divine, and get them involved in their community. The church started in houses, from house to house, breaking bread together, having all things in common. And and I think that we need to go back to that model of a community. Let the people who have the light take the light, and share that light with those who are. Uh, don't have the opportunity to hear. I, I heard about, the, I heard, I heard about the goodness of the Lord in my mother's house, not at some temple, some sanctuary. It was modeled, and and so I think that community again, we have an awesome opportunity uh, to show forth the reality of what faith can do when we come together in love. And I think we have an opportunity now that we are shut out from the church. We have a um, a chance, not not you know, to to be the arms and legs of the pastor and Jesus well, Christ, you know, yeah. not to be against them, but to be to help them to be for them, mm-hmm. you know. It, it's mm-hmm. just uh, I, I well I well I don't want to talk about my own church, so I just shut up right now. Not be quiet. <laughs> Be quiet. That's right, because we're gonna tell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I guess we're kind of uh, Reverend Bowie. Uh, do you have any other comments you want to make, or we want to thank uh, Rabbi Ruth oh. so much for being with us. Yeah, uh, man. No, it's uh, awesome. You all have been more than kind and gracious and giving me more time than I deserve. <laughs> Thank, I thank you for the honor and, you know, just thank you for the opportunity to hear your voices. And I, I, as I said, I'd like to give you each a hug. And I, I am so impressed with the work that you're doing. And, and as was said earlier, it will never stop. It will be ongoing. You have to, as you, as you cross one, one hurdle, the next one will arise. But you have the strength yeah. 
God has given you that strength and that gift, and you will do it. And I am with Amen. you in any way that I can. Well, thank you. Well, you're on the email list, so you'll be notified of all future emails. And I'm sorry I got the two memos. I had one memo with seven points on it, then the second memo. So I kind of got them confused. So I apologize for not having but gotten those out in the time top, away. Because I, I love that spiritual quote at the end. If you think you know what spirituality is, then you're wrong. You know? <laughs> okay. Great. Thank you so much, everybody. I, I just feel mm -hmm. held by you, and um, you're a wonderful group. Well, thank you. Thank you. Well, Reverend Bowie, who's going to pray us thank out? You. Oh, uh -huh.